organic synthesis with ethers and epoxides. We're going to work a few examples. I'll give you a reactant and a product and show you kind of how to approach solving a typical organic synthesis problem. Now, I know this chapter also has sulfides and thiols in it, um, but many of you aren't going to be on the hook for those anyways, and there's so little chemistry there that it's not something commonly tested upon in terms of synthesis. Now, this lesson is part of my organic chemistry playlist, and I'm releasing these lessons weekly. So if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so let's take a look here. And I alluded to this in the last chapter on alcohols, but uh, the further we go into the second semester of organic chemistry here, uh, and the more reactions you kind of have in your tool belt, the more likely it is you're going to get a synthesis problem where you've got multiple possible routes to do it. And this is going to be one of them here. So if we kind of take a look here, so first thing I'm going to do is kind of take a look at your carbon skeleton here. And it's pretty easy to see where that matches up. The only real difference here is this methoxy group. And uh, first thing you should do is recognize where that carbon skeleton matches up. Okay, so check the box off there. But then also see kind of like what functional groups we've got present here. So while we're starting with an alkane, so, and then we're ending up with an ether. So we've got to make an ether. Now, one thing to note, and I, I told you about this uh, somewhere along the way in, in synthesis, if you've started with an alkane, there's only one thing you know how to do, and that's turn it into an alkyl halide, free radical halogenation. There's nothing else available. So the rest of this, we're going to work backwards, but I can do the first step forwards. And so in this case, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So free radical halogenation, and I could have used NBS here as well, because it'll do the same thing. Uh, uh, and a lot of times, you know, a lot of students like to use NBS ubiquitously because it, it works here, but it also works when you're trying to specifically go allylically. But uh, in this case, I'm just going to use BR2 and light, and it is going to replace a hydrogen on the most substituted carbon. And get us this lovely alkyl halide. So, but from here, we're going to work this backwards. So the question is, how in the world do we make this lovely species? So if we work this backwards, and we've got a few different ways to make an ether, and one of them simply would be SN1. And to do SN1, you'd need a good leaving group. Hint, hint, wink, wink. So one possibility here then is just to simply... So to get this particular OCH3, you'd need to use methanol. So... And you'd heat it up a good amount and stuff like this. But the problem is the hotter you heat it, the more uh, elimination starts happening as well. So this is your SN1 product. So, but E1 is going to compete with it and you'll get an alkene as well. So even though this could potentially work and it would be a lovely two-step synthesis, the yield is not going to be great and we, consider, we should consider all our options here. So another way to make this would be to start with an alkene. So, and I could start with this alkene right here, or I could potentially start with this alkene right here. And either one of these would involve the uh, addition of an alcohol, Markovnikov. And we've got two ways to pull that off. Now, we could do this with methanol and a good strong acid, an acid catalyzed addition of an alcohol. So we'd form a, a tertiary carbocation here, so it's not going to have to worry about rearrangements. Uh, and in this case, it would add an H and the OCH3, and you'd get this lovely product. And you can do the same thing here. So, But in addition to acid catalyzed addition of an alcohol, you can also do alkoxy mercuration demercuration. So if we take a look at that, that would be where you've got your mercuric acetate. And instead of water, your particular alcohol. And then you follow that up with sodium borohydride for the demercuration. Cool. And it turns out either one of these, it's Markovnikov either way, so either one of these, it turns out, would have worked in either case. And so that's a possibility. So the question is, well, then could we make an alkene? Well, yeah, we could make an alkene. Alkenes are made from elimination reactions. And again, E2 is preferable to E1 since we can do E2 reactions without uh, and we, we have ways of avoiding SN2 competing and stuff like this. And so the question is, could we make either one of these alkenes? Well, yeah. To make an alkene, I need a good leaving group. Well, I've got one here. And so to make either one of these alkenes, I can look and say, okay, this would be the Zaitsev alkene. And we know how to pull that off. So in this case, I use a nice strong base, but not a bulky base. So I could use like NaOH or NaOCH3 or NaOET or something like that. Sodium hydroxide, methoxide, ethoxide, any non-bulky base. But I could also make the anti zaitsev or Hoffman product if I use my bulky base. T-butoxide here. Cool. And so we've got another synthesis. And now in this case, we got one, two, three steps. And those both work, and they're not bad. They're one step longer than this, but now I don't really have as many side competing reactions like I would here with SN1 and E1 competing. So great synthesis. 
not the only way we have to go here either. So another way to make an ether is with the Williamson ether synthesis. And when you look at the Williamson ether synthesis, so uh, you got an oxygen surrounded by two carbons and on one side, it's gonna be part of the nucleophile where the oxygen's nucleophilic. And on the other side, it's gonna be the electrophile where you have a good alkyl halide for doing SN2. And so the question you have to ask yourself is between these two carbons, a methyl carbon and a tertiary carbon, which one would be better as the electrophile, as the alkyl halide and SN2 reaction? And again, it's all about backside attack, and the best backside attack would definitely be on the methyl halide. And in fact, you can't attack a tertiary halide in an SN2 reaction. And so in this case, then your other option would be so having that whole side as the nucleophile, and then the appropriate methyl halide. Let's make that bromine look a little better, cleaner. Cool. And you're just doing SN2. So simply doing backside attack, kick off the bromine, and you're here. Well, the question is then, well, how would you make this alkoxide? And if you recall with the Williamson ether synthesis, well, you make that from the corresponding alcohol. And you just add like sodium, you know, lithium, potassium, or sodium hydride, one of the more common ones. And you go there, well then how would you make this alcohol? Well, you could make this alcohol, so in a few different ways, um, but most notably, I would look at making that alcohol probably from either one of these alkenes. It'd probably be my favorite way. Technically, you could try and do it with water right here and do SN1, but again, then you got that whole SN1E1 thing again, and it's more steps, and you've, if you're gonna go that route, you just do it in two steps instead. So, but making it from either one of these alkenes so it would be Markovnikov addition, and you could do acid catalyzed hydration. So like dilute H2SO4 or H2SO4 in water or H3O plus. You could also do oxymercuration demercuration. So mercuric acetate with water followed by sodium borohydride. Uh, either one of those go Markovnikov and we're not gonna worry about rearrangements. And so a couple different ways, but notice all of a sudden now we're getting pretty long on our synthesis. It would be one step, two steps, three steps, four steps, five steps. So. And we've already got a couple of different ways that go through three steps. And so your best bet, in this case, step one, and either one of these could be step two. So, and then from here, either one of these could be your step three. And that's probably gonna be the pre preferred synthesis. So is this last way we did with the Williams synthesis gonna work? Yeah, but it's five steps, whereas I can do it in three. So if you were gonna, uh, you know, get do such an example on an exam or something like that in your OCHEM class. So in all likelihood, you're gonna get full credit for going for one of these. And in fact, even this two-step route, you're probably gonna get a significant amount of credit for. There's a competing reaction and stuff like that, but they'll probably look at this and be like, yeah, I can see that. And I would bet you're either gonna get full points or 90% of the points. So, and then for this last one with the Williamson ether synthesis, that's five steps, you're probably gonna lose a few points on that one, being that there are some ways that are much shorter in producing the same result. Let's take a look at another example. All right, so we take a look at this next example and I see we've got eight carbons in our starting material and the same eight carbons are really easy to identify here. And we've got one extra carbon here and we can see here that at the very least, we're gonna have to make this carbon-carbon bond right here. And if we're gonna make a carbon-carbon bond, you're pretty much looking at either the acetylide reaction or a Grignard reaction. So and in this case, uh, a satellite's got two carbons, and so that's not the most likely thing. I mean, we could add two and then take off one with ozonolysis or something, but that'd be a lot of work. So, but it, it is something that's a possibility, but would be a ton of work and a ton of extra steps here. But most likely we're doing this through the Grignard. One other thing we can look at is that there's an alcohol in the neighborhood. When there's an alcohol in the neighborhood, it means that your Grignard in all likelihood either attacked a ketone or an aldehyde or an epoxide. So, and being that epoxides are part of this chapter, that should be something on your mind. So, but also in this case, the carbon-carbon bond you're making, the carbon you're bonding to is not the one with the OH, it's the next carbon over. And that's the evidence that you've attacked an epoxide with your Grignard in this case. So again, if the OH had been on the carbon that you're attached to, that you're attaching to, one side of that carbon-carbon bond, that's evidence you attacked a ketone aldehyde. But in this case, we definitely attacked an epoxide. And so if we go back one step here, we can pull this off. So right here, and in this case, I'm gonna end up with a bond between this carbon and the oxygen, making that epoxide. And then this guy here is your Grignard, the methyl Grignard in this case. Followed by your acid workup step. Cool, and that would produce it. And so the question is, well then how do we make this epoxide? Well, 
Uh, for you guys, you've learned a couple of different ways to make an epoxide, but the most notable way is from the corresponding alkene. In this case, using a peroxy acid like MCPBA. Or you could just simply generically write, you know, RCO3H for a generic peroxy acid. You might see it that way, but I like using a specific one when I'm doing a synthesis problem. And so the question is, well, how do we make an alkene? Well, we make an alkene from a corresponding alkyl halide with an elimination reaction. And so in this case, we got a couple of different options. I could have the halogen on this carbon, but I could also have it on this carbon. Obviously, I'm putting this one in line for a reason. So because this is going to be the way we're going to go. So if I look at, you know, getting a bromine in one of these two positions, it's going to be some work to get it here. To get it way out here, I'd have to actually do it through an alkene right there and do HBr and peroxide, which would do Antomarkovnikov. But if I'm trying to, you know, go backwards and make this alkene, it wouldn't make sense then to already have this alkene in the past and go through here. However, here, that's the benzylic carbon right there. And I can definitely put a bromine on there right from the get-go using NBS. Cool, forms that resonant stabilized radical and it's gonna be the only brominated product here when using NBS. Cool, and there's our synthesis. And notice we've got quite a few steps here. So one, uh, oh, I forgot to add the reagent here. So reagent for doing E2 elimination here, we should use, and in this case, I'm gonna go bulky. It doesn't have to be a bulky base. There's only one place to actually form the alkene. You can only form it right here, but the reason I'm going bulky is that we've got a secondary halide, and so SN2 could compete. And you probably learned somewhere along the way that when it's benzylic, uh, that actually activates SN2. And so it's secondary, so you'd think about, oh, it's E2 is going to dominate anyways, but this is actually kind of a little bit activated towards SN2. And so covering my bases here and making sure we're doing E2 by going with that bulky base. And again, that's the only place the alkene can even form. So this carbon is the beta carbon with hydrogens. This beta carbon doesn't have any hydrogens. You can't form the alkene there. You'd violate the octet rule, you got all sorts of issues there. So only place you can form, but again, there still is an advantage to using that bulky base. So but there's a synthesis, one, two, three, four step synthesis, pretty typical for this stage of the game. Let's take a look at one final example. All right, so this last synthesis here, and first wanna match up the carbons on a reactant with the carbons on our product. And I see I've got, you know, six carbons in a ring and that methyl group right there. And so we've got our six carbons in a ring and one additional carbon right there. And so it doesn't look like we're making any new carbon-carbon bonds. So however, so we've got this lovely species that's new and the alcohol that's new. So, and this lovely species, the ethoxy group there. So usually added through uh, as a good nucleophile in some way, shape or form. Uh, and then we see this alcohol here and some bells should be going off in your head. And again, think about this also in the context of what chapter it shows up in, because those are the reactions that are most likely to try and emphasize on a synthesis problem. And uh, in this case, when you've got the OH nearby, where you're adding a new nucleophile, you should think strongly about your epoxides. Epoxides, when you attack them with a nucleophile, it opens them up, forming an alcohol, and then you'll have an, a nucleophile attached on the next carbon over. And that's exactly what we've got right here. And so in this case, good chance this came from the corresponding epoxide. Cool. Now, when we look at attacking this epoxide here, so what makes this part of a good synthesis is you guys learned that when we do uh, ring opening of epoxides, as we'll do here, you can do it with a strong nucleophile, which we'd attack the less substitute side, or you can do it uh, acid catalyzed, which often attacks the more substitute side, tertiary is preferred than primary than secondary, if you recall. So in this case, I look at where that nucleophile is attaching, that nucleophile is attaching right here on the more substitute side. So if we were doing this under uh, conditions of a strong nucleophile, then it would be attaching on this less substitute side. So definitely not doing this with a strong nucleophile. We're gonna do this in some sort of acid catalyzed conditions. And my nucleophile then is gonna be a weak nucleophile, which in this case wouldn't be ethoxide but would be ethanol, the neutral species where it's weak, but we're definitely gonna need an acid catalyst like sulfuric acid here. And in this case, it definitely is gonna prefer the tertiary side over the primary side, just as it should. The more substituted side is how many of you would have learned this. Uh, and it's gonna give us exactly this. So we're gonna protonate this thing. That O is gonna become the O of the OH. We'll protonate it. So, and then, uh, ethanol is going to come and attack on the more substitute side, opening up the ring, and then we'll deprotonate that ethanol that just attacked, leading us to that product. So that's the mechanism, but from a synthesis standpoint, this is all we got to show. 
the question is then, well, how do we make that epoxide? And again, you make that epoxide likelihood from the corresponding alkene. So how do we make an alkene? Well, we make an alkene from an alkyl halide doing E2 elimination. And in this case, I can see that I've got really two options. So, and actually, <laughs> my two options, I've got to have the bromine in one of these two locations if I'm doing E2 elimination. So one option would be this guy, but the other option would be simply having it right there, which is what I start with. So that's going to be the easiest option. So I won't worry about this pathway. That would be a little more work to get to, and in fact would be a little counterintuitive, but we'd actually have to have the alkene already here so we could do HBr peroxide so that we could make the same alkene we would have already had and it's not going to work. All right, so here though we can see that, you know, uh, we want to do E2 elimination, but we also see that we want to make the anti zaitsefer hoffman alkene. So the Zaitsev product would form the more substitute alkene either here or here. If I want to specifically get that Hoffman less substitute alkene, well then we've got to use that bulky base, another place where we've got to use our bulky base. And again, uh, there are other ones out there besides T-butoxide, but this is for many of you, the only one you've seen, it's the one I'm going to pretty ubiquitously use. But if you want to use DBU or DBN or something like that, because you've learned it in your class, fantastic. So, but I, I would pretty much make a point of only using T-butoxide in pretty much any synthesis problem when I'm trying to use a bulky base. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? That makes sure that other eyes are going to see this lesson as well and also hopefully find it uh, helpful. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you're looking for practice problems or maybe you're reviewing for your final exam, you're looking for the final exam rapid review or practice final exams, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. A free trial is also available.